of American foreign policy. And we're honored and pleased uh, to have Ambassador Negroponte join us. Uh, his, uh, the, the, the topic is uh, always of interest to us. Um, we're constantly sensitive to the condition of our policies, and uh, nearly everyone in this room deeply interested in that. Uh, Ambassador Negroponte has had a marvelous career. Of course, he was born, born in London, educated at Yale, graduated in 1960, the same year he joined the State Department and served as a Foreign Service officer for 37 years. Uh, during that time, he, was, uh, he had uh, eight overseas assignments in, in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, as well as assignments at the Department of State and uh, at the White House. And among those uh, assignments were Ambassador to Honduras, Ambassador to Mexico, Ambassador to the Philippines. He was Assistant, Secret he was Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Environmental, and Scientific Policies. He also served as the Deputy Assistant uh, Director, uh, to, uh, Deputy Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. Uh, after a few years of retirement after that uh, 37 years, which wasn't exactly retirement, he was with McGraw-Hill, um, then he was prevailed upon by the President of the United States to return to public service. Uh, he uh, uh, served then in a, a series of, of capacities. He was our uh, uh, first director of uh, Central Intelligence, uh, the, was the director of that group. He also served as ambassador to Iraq, and before those two assignments, for four years, he was our ambassador to the United Nations. And now he has a fourth major task within this administration, and that, of course, is as deputy uh, secretary of state, where he's essentially the CEO or operating, chief operating officer uh, of the department and an assistant to the, the secretary. Uh, the career is uh, quite remarkable. It's one of great distinction and uh, great dedication. Uh, it's my enormous pleasure to present to you uh, one of the nation's, as I say, most distinguished and dedicated public servants, Ambassador John Negroponte. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Byrd, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with uh, all of you tonight. And um, I also want to thank uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, your chairman, uh, Mr. Robbie Harris, for having sponsored uh, this event and all uh, others who were involved in its preparation. Uh, across the country, uh, and of course here in Baltimore, Americans are preparing to vote in just three short weeks, and a new administration will take office in just three short months. With the prospect of change on the horizon, I want to focus my remarks this evening on several foreign policy priorities that will likely, uh, and in my view should, uh, remain important issues for the next president, uh, whomever that may be. An increasingly uh, globalized and multipolar world holds major challenges and opportunities for our nation. And how successfully we deal with them will determine the shape of the international order and the nature of American power, security, and prosperity in the years ahead. Let me start by discussing the war on terror. Our goal, as you know, is to defeat Al-Qaeda and to diminish the appeal of violent extremism. Clearly, our most pressing need is to prevent existing extremists from launching attacks and kinetic action, that is, action to capture and kill extremists and to prevent them from communicating, traveling, and moving money has achieved good progress towards uh, that end. But as uh, Secretary of Defense Gates has said, we cannot kill or capture our way to victory in this war. Defeating extremism will require denying extremist groups safe havens and new rec recruits, 
by supporting the growth of societies that are governed by law with accountable, transparent institutions that respond to the needs of people. And although this will be a generational struggle, we have already seen populations from Pakistan to Jordan to Iraq to Saudi Arabia turn against Al-Qaeda. In large part, due to the atrocities Al-Qaeda has inflicted on fellow Muslims, the appeal of extremist ideologies is at a low ebb in the Muslim world. Across the broader Middle East and beyond, moderate forces are resisting the extremists who are trying to hijack their peaceful region. Nevertheless, major challenges lie ahead. Foremost among them is reinforcing Iraq's recent progress and helping it overcome remaining obstacles to its success. Our goal is an Iraq that is federal, plural, pluralistic, democratic, and unified. An Iraq that is at peace with itself, uh, with its neighbors, and with the international community. Every day, in ways big and small, Iraqis are advancing towards that goal, and we are supporting them. They are rejecting extremism, pursuing reconciliation, expanding opportunity, and assuming control of their country's future. Iraq's progress is fragile and reversible, but it is also significant and hopeful. For some perspective, consider the challenges Iraq faced when I arrived at, there as ambassador in June of 2004. An increasingly widespread and lethal insurgency, a weak central government unable to provide security or public services, extremist infiltration of key institutions, including security forces, heavy foreign debt, and profound reluctance by neighboring states to recognize, much less engage with, Iraq's new government. Consider the situation today. The citizens of uh, El Anbar province have made decisive progress in expelling Al-Qaeda from their province. Muqtada uh, al-Sadr, the uh, uh, Shia extremist, has declared a ceasefire. Iraq's government is asserting its sovereignty through successful operations in Basra, in Sadr City, Mosul, and elsewhere. Iraq's economy is growing by approximately 9% this year. Political reconciliation is progressing and several of Iraq's neighbors have named ambassadors to Iraq, while several more have made high-level official visits. The significant progress of the past 20 months does not mean our work in Iraq is over. The reconciliation process in particular requires time and patience and depends on the security situations, security situation continuing to improve. Sustaining United States involvement, both military and diplomatic, is vital. In addition, Iraq must overcome several hurdles of its own along the road to success. First, it must pass meaningful hydrocarbon legislation that equitably divides oil revenue among Iraq's regions. Second, it must hold successful provincial elections, which will allow Iraqis and particularly Sunnis, who largely boycotted the first provincial elections in 2005, that is to say the elections that were conducted while I was ambassador there, to participate in selecting their local councils. Third, Iraq must continue professionalizing its security forces and must make good on its promise to give jobs to the 100,000 so-called sons of Iraq who are contributing to local security. Fourth, Iraq and the United States must provide for the continued presence of United States forces after December 31st of this year by concluding a status of forces agreement. And fifth, Iraq's government and the Kurds must manage the status of Kirkuk 
and other mixed Arab Kurd cities in the oil-rich north. These challenges are both a measure of how far Iraq has come and of how far it yet has to go. But as Iraqis work through these challenges, what's already clear is their overwhelming rejection of extremists' bleak vision for their country. Al-Qaeda has suffered an ideological and strategic defeat. It is in retreat in Iraq, and, it is, and its deliberate, unrestrained killing of fellow Muslims, both Shia and Sunni, is discrediting its ideology throughout the Muslim world. Osama bin Laden once called Iraq the perfect base and sought to establish a footing there for al-Qaeda's offensive presence in the Arab world. Today, al-Qaeda increase, increasingly has no base in Iraq. In losing El Anbar province, it also will lose its most significant toehold in the Arab world. Al-Qaeda cannot be allowed to regain it. The emerging sovereign Iraqi state also represents a setback for Iran. Iran's regime hoped Iraq would serve as a platform for projecting Iranian influence into the Arab world. But through its actions against uh, Iranian-backed militias, Iraq has made two things clear. It will not be a client state of Tehran, and it will not be a theocracy. Iraq's leaders do not see the world as Iran's do. For Iraq's leaders, the main distinction is not between Sunni and Shia, but between moderates and extremists. The emerging Iraq reflects th this worldview, pluralistic, democratic, and a partner in regional stability. In Afghanistan, as in Iraq, when the people have had an opportunity to choose a course for their nation, they have voted overwhelmingly and often at great personal risk and sacrifice for a future of democracy, law, prosperity, and modernity. The Taliban's theory of victory is not to prevail on the battlefield or simply to win Afghan hearts and minds. It is to undermine the elected Afghan government, fracture the international coalition, and outlast us in Afghanistan. Our theory of victory and our counterinsurgency strategy to achieve it recognizes that defeating the Taliban on the battlefield is not enough. Working with our Afghan and international partners, we can render the Taliban obsolete by supporting an effective, accountable Afghan state that can provide for human security through good governance, the rule of law, and economic opportunity. When, where the Afghan government and its armed forces working uh, with our international partners has been able to do so, for instance, in the north and the east of Afghanistan, the Taliban is in retreat. The Taliban can only prevail if the international community and our Afghan partners lose our will and our commitment to help the Afghan people build their new nation. One of the main challenges to a stable Afghanistan and more broadly to defeating global terrorism is the tra trajectory of Pakistan. Pakistan is a vitally important nation. It is the world's third most populous Muslim state. It is a nuclear power. It is situated in the strategically crucial neighborhood of India, Iran, Afghanistan, and China. And it is a frontline state in the war on terrorism. The United States and our allies face near-term challenges from Pakistan's reluctance and inability to roll back terrorist sanctuaries in the tribal region. And we must balance the need to address those challenges with our longer-run interest in partnering with Pakistan's moderate civilian leaders to build an effective democratic state capable of co-opting 
or defeating its internal adversaries. This objective requires supporting Pakistan's democratic institutions and civil society groups that have their own interests in taking on violent extremism. It requires a long-term partnership with the Pakistani government in a broad effort to promote the key elements necessary to Pakistan's long-term stability, including, among other things, security, education, economic opportunity, good governance, and rule of law especially in the tribal regions where the absence of adequate security forces and governance enable terrorists to find sanctuary. Supporting moderate political forces against extremism is also crucial to achieving lasting peace in the Middle East. And progress towards this purpose, in turn, reinforces the vision of moderate nonviolent forces throughout the region. The administration, this administration, has helped to launch and support a negotiations process between the parties that will provide our successor with a foundation on which to seek a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace. The process between Israelis and Palestinians recognize the need, recognizes the need for progress on several tracks at once settlement of permanent status issues, support for Palestinian security, governance, and economic institutions, and fulfillment of roadmap obligations. We are hopeful of success because the Israelis and Palestinians now have leaders who share a commitment to peace. On the Palestinian side, we are supporting responsible leaders in an unprecedented Precedented effort to realign their society around the va values of nonviolence. Of course, Hamas's control of, the, of Gaza is deeply troubling and threatens both Israel Israelis' security and the Palestinians' well being. But that control also means that Hamas and other violent extremists can no longer hide in the shadows, destroying all prospects for peace without bearing any consequences for their actions. They are now being forced to make the fundamental choice they have always refused to make. Either you're a terrorist group or you're a political party, but you cannot be both. All of the challenges I mentioned intersect with another major challenge in the region, Iran. Our current focus, shared by the international community, is on ending Iran's production of fissile material that can be used to make nuclear weapons. We are also working to end Iran's other weapon of mass destruction and long-range missile programs, and to, to push Iran to abandon its support for terrorist and ins insurgent groups, destabilizing democratically elected governments in Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, and the Palestinian Authority. Finally, we continue to support the great and proud Iranian people in their pursuit of human dignity, human rights, and greater liberty. We view the Iranian people as a natural friend of the United States. We affirm our friendship at every opportunity, and we emphasize to the Iranian people the grave costs of their government's policies deeper isolation for their country, and a worse quality of life for themselves. We have made clear to the Iranian regime the potential benefits of changing course and rejoining the community of nations as a responsible, constructive member. Those benefits include cooperation on peaceful nuclear energy, including light water reactors, increased trade and investment, deepening integration into the global economy, growing financial and technological assistance, and an opportunity to build better relations with the international community, including the United States. But if Iranian leaders continue to support terrorists, continue to pursue a nuclear weapons capability, and continue to subvert their neighbors, we will rally the international community to deepen its isolation. 
In addition to the challenges posed by weak states and those posed by Iran, the United States is increasingly moving into a multi-dimensional world with more centers of power than in previous decades. Different powers uh, present different sets of challenges and opportunities. But as a general matter, the United States welcomes the rise of strong, capable partners willing to assume their fair share of responsibility as stakeholders in the international system. We are particularly eager to build close strategic partnerships with large pluralistic democracies like Brazil and India. Earlier this month, we achieved a milestone in our relationship with India when President Bush signed the Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement into law. This agreement culminates eight years of steady progress, strengthening the natural bonds between our two countries. Such partnerships with fellow democracies are a platform for projecting influence and for cooperating on the full panorama of common interests. Those interests include long-term challenges of international governance, such as free trade and climate change. We cannot reach effective solutions to such challenges without consensus among both developed and developing major economies, especially India and China. Building that consensus has not been easy. The Indians and the Chinese are understand understandably concerned about sustaining economic growth and shielding their populations and industries from the dislocations of global trade. Indeed, many Americans have similar concerns. But as major stakeholders in the international system, especially in the global trading system from which they, as much as anyone, are benefiting, India and China should join us in leading the way towards a successful conclusion of the Doha uh, trade round, that is to say the World Trade Organization uh, round of talks, and the post-Kyoto uh, framework on uh, climate change. On trade especially, the United States Congress should e exercise leadership of its own by ratifying our free trade agreements with Panama, Colombia, and South Korea. Finally, let me say a few words about Russia. Recent events, of course, have focused attention on Russia's international role. Russia's invasion and occupation of Georgia, or of parts of it at least, the violation of international agreements, and the recognition of Abkhaz and Ossetian independence all call into question Russia's commitment to the international order. But Russia today is not the Soviet Union. Its prosperity depends on participation in the international economy. And Russia stands only to gain from further integration into the international politic, political and economic architecture. Russia's leaders need to decide what future they want for their country. We and our European allies are willing to support Russia's deepening integration into global markets and institutions, but only if Russia respects the rules of the game. We will not let Russia recreate a sphere of influence where sovereignty is ignored, democracy is subverted, and weak states live at the mercy of strong ones. I want to conclude by emphasizing the importance of America's leadership. Whether we're discussing challenges arising from particular countries or global governance challenges such as climate change, free trade, or energy security, American leadership will be necessary to rally capable powers to uphold the international order on which we all depend. Sustaining that leadership will, as ever, be a challenge for the Department of State. 
And President Bush and Secretary Rice have begun the long process of equipping our department to meet that challenge by increasing our resources and adjusting our diplomatic posture to reflect the emergence of new international and regional powers. Sustaining American leadership is also a matter of sustaining the will among Americans to lead, to accept responsibilities, and bear the burdens that global leadership entails. Americans must understand the stake of United States leadership, the challenges and opportunities our country faces in responding to and shaping a dynamic, globalizing world. Spreading that understanding is the work not only of those of us in government, but of organizations such as this that educate fellow citizens about international affairs. So let me once again thank the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs for hosting me, and I look forward uh, to answering your questions. Thank you very much. You referred several times to the rule of law, and I wonder how the United States can reestablish its reputation and its credibility when it has regularly flaunted the rule of law and subverted its, its aims, particularly in the, uh, in the area of intelligence. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, sure. I guess I disagree with the uh, premise of your question. I guess that's the first important thing to say. Uh, but, <laughs> But, but let me say, as somebody who's been ambassador to the UN, I've negotiated 200 uh, Security Council resolutions. Uh, those uh, resolutions, as you know, uh, are binding uh, on member states of the United Nations. And I don't, we weren't just uh, negotiating those resolutions for our amusement. It's because uh, we, we believe uh, strongly uh, in working uh, with the interna international system. And uh, uh, I think that uh, if you look at the architecture of the international system, whether it's political with the United Nations or it's economic with the IMF and the World Bank, uh, we have been in the forefront of helping establish and sustain these structures uh, over time. So uh, I think we, uh, uh, I'm sure one can find uh, uh, differences of view as to particular actions we've taken at one time or another, and uh, you know, honest people can differ. But uh, I c I'm here to assure you, as somebody who started his diplomatic career in 1960, that uh, you know we are very committed to uh, promoting the rule of law and democracy around the world. We think it's actually the best way to assure a sustained and uh, lasting international peace. Uh, on intelligence, uh, uh, let me just say that while I was National Intelligence Director for almost uh, two years, um, I'm satisfied that the, the activities that we carried out uh, were, number one, uh, legal, uh, number two, done in the national interest, and perhaps number three, and most important, uh, had a lot of safeguards uh, built into them, uh, both uh, within our own programs and, of course, with uh, oversight from the Congress and uh, the media. One of the most interesting experiences I had when I became Director of National Intelligence was to go to uh, a uh, dinner of the White House uh, Correspondents Association, an annual event that occurs in uh, Washington, uh, a few weeks after I'd been confirmed in that new job. I must have met 20 or 30 journalists who covered intelligence full time. And I said, how on earth has this happened? I mean, 30, 40 years ago, people didn't talk about intelligence uh, matters. But I, I think, you know, in addition to congressional oversight, I think our media and our public has quite a bit of visibility into what we do in our intelligence activities. Yes, sir. Um, I have an interest in the asylum system in the United States. In the what? The asylum system. A accounting? Asylum, asylum system. Oh, asylum system, sorry. That's all right. 
Why don't you come uh, a little closer to the mic? I just yeah. The uh, the role of the State Department in that usually revolves around the preparation of country condition reports or uh, human rights reports. Uh, I've heard there have been some changes in how those are prepared. Could you maybe comment on their preparation and the role of our broader foreign policy goals uh, in the editing of them? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty um, hearing absolutely everything you said. Uh, do I have a comment as to? The preparation of country condition reports by the State Department and the um, influence of our broader foreign policy goals on their editing. Right. And whether or not our broader foreign policy goals influence the preparation of those, is that what you're driving at with your question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, I was, for most of my, when I was a career diplomatic officer, which I was for 37 years, I was what they call a political officer, so it, it uh, I, I, one of my responsibilities at various times was to oversee uh, the preparation or actually prepare uh, human rights uh, reports. And it was a real novelty in 1973 or so when the law came out establishing the requirement that we do uh, reports on human rights conditions in various countries. And not only that we have that requirement, but that there were uh, stipulations in the law that if countries failed to meet certain standards, then we could apply certain kinds of sanctions under law. And then a whole body of uh, law developed around the question of uh, whether countries are living up to um, the proper human rights standards or not. Um, my impression over, the, over this, this span of time, over several decades, is that initially, since we were all kind of at the beginning traditional diplomats, the idea of commenting on the internal conditions in another country in a public, unclassified United States government was, was not our view of traditional diplomacy. I think we were rather traditional diplomatists. We, we were reluctant to do that. So if you look at the first generation of those reports, say the first five, 10 years, they're kind of skimpy uh, and kind of sort of brushed over things fairly lightly. But my impression in the last uh, 25 years is that these human rights reports, and you've seen them, they're tomes this thick, uh, are really quite detailed. And uh, I think uh, basically call things the way they are. And whereas I used to, maybe a sort of a defensive reaction of my own, uh, as an ambassador, I would take an interest in uh, reviewing the drafts of these reports before they went to Washington. About, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, I just gave up on that. I said, look, you guys call it the way you see it down there in the political section or wherever and send the report in to Washington and let the chips fall where they may. And I think that's probably the attitude of most ambassadors today. So I would say people are really pretty straightforward and forthright in how they call the human rights situations in various uh, countries. Now, you know, there's the separate issue of uh, what you do about bad human rights conditions when you find them, and should you be friendly uh, with countries that have bad human rights conditions, and then that gets you into a whole other area of discussion. Sir. Hypothetically, let's assume that Russia has made military alliances with Mexico and Canada. How would we feel about that? And now going to Russia's problem with Georgia, we have encouraged all the former satellites to join NATO and including Georgia. So basically, the, Soviet, the old Soviet Union is surrounded, or very close to Soviet Union, or countries that are now part of our military alliance. Georgia then attacks two provinces and Russia intercedes. Don't you think Russia has some justification for these fears? Um, here's, here's a key difference. Well, first of all, they haven't done anything like that with Canada or Mexico, and I, I suspect if they tried, they'd not be likely to succeed. You remember the Zimmerman telegram uh, when the Germans tried to do this uh, at the time of uh, World War I and efforts to enlist uh, Mexico. I think that's the last time. That was one of Barbara Tuckman's really best books, I think, uh, that discussed that whole situation. So I, I don't think that's likely to happen. I think that's a hypothetical 
scenario. They did with Cuba. They did do it with Cuba, and it was problematic for us. But uh, again, let me get to my what I think is the real punchline, is that the countries you're talking about who have joined NATO are democratic countries, and it was their free choice. They elected their governments and by their own free choice applied for membership in NATO. And I think that's the fundamental difference. And uh, the, the Russians take umbrage at that. I don't think they have anything to fear. Uh, and I don't think that anybody uh, bears them ill, but uh, I don't believe that uh, they have uh, some kind of inherent right to dictate to their neighbors through pressure tactics and coercive tactics, including the violation of their, these countries' sovereignty, uh, how it is they ought to behave. So uh, I think it's a question of what kind of behavior is really access, uh, acceptable um, uh, going forward in this century. Thank you, Ambassador, for a, a good overview, uh, especially with respect to the, uh, uh, the U.S. foreign policy imperatives in, uh, in South Asia. Uh, talking about uh, Pakistan in particular, um, the, the U.S. has been involved in that uh, part of the world for the last uh, uh, 55, 60 years, and especially uh, since the, uh, the uh, Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and more recently, uh, in the uh, war on terror against Al-Qaeda, uh, I would like to submit that, uh, uh, given the economic hardships uh, that, that uh, are, uh, are a reality today, uh, more effective results uh, can be obtained by a more uh, understanding and benevolent approach, uh, not just uh, backing individuals uh, in, in uh, such countries, but reaching out uh, to citizen groups and NGOs uh, all over the Muslim world, and uh, and for the U.S. to uh, to support uh, such groups, which uh, will uh, be able, so we could win the hearts and minds of uh, of citizens uh, in those countries, and uh, um, and and uh, that would be the most effective uh, weapon against uh, radicalism and uh, terrorism. Uh, would like your uh, thoughts on yeah, on this. and look. <laughs> It's got to be a two-pronged approach. There's just no question about it. And nobody could be more in favor uh, of, uh, of using uh, and of taking an approach that, uh, that puts emphasis on improving the well-being of people, uh, strengthening the rule of law, encouraging uh, good governance, and so forth. I mean, if you uh, maybe just to move to another part of the planet for a moment, if you look at our policies towards Africa, the uh, dramatic increases in assistance to that uh, continent by uh, the administration, particularly in the, the, uh, the AIDS program, the HIV AIDS program, so-called PEPFAR, the President's uh, Program for the Prevention of, uh, of AIDS and Related Diseases. Um, sure, that has to be done, but what do you do about violent extremists who, in order to make their point, uh, carry out brutal executions and brutal attacks. You cannot defeat the Al-Qaeda or extremist Taliban in the frontier areas of uh, Pakistan with uh, peaceful means alone, because these people are helpless against that kind of uh, armed effort. But in parallel with our desire to support the security forces in dealing with that issue in the tribal areas, we have a five-year, $150 million a year development program for the FATA, the federally administered tribal areas. So I, I think the answer is uh, you've got to do both. I'm going to ask if you agree with a proposition that I ardently and have often put forth my question would be, would you take measures to advance it? And the proposition is this. Having worked in the denazification program, I found that the Marshall Plan was the best way to make a dramatic change in that area. And it succeeded, and I don't have to tell you how well, because we have an excellent dem democratic country in Germany. Uh, I have also now recently worked with others to produce a Marshall Plan for the Palestinians, not aid, but enablement, to make them trading partners with Israel. People who are advancing their families obviously would rather not blow themselves up. 
and my feeling is this would be key to peace in the Middle East and possibly the world. If you agree with this, would you take measures to promote it? Yeah, well, uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to That's it. That's the short answer. But let me just say, first of all, about the Marshall Plan. Let's not forget, the Marshall Plan came after four years of war. I mean, Hitler had to be beaten. And uh, that, that problem had to be dealt with first. But the denazification hadn't been resolved. So really, it hadn't been beaten. Patton was killed well after the end, what we called the end of the war. And I was living in Germany at the time. There wasn't peace there. Well, there wasn't a the shooting SS war. The SA were still fighting. Yeah, there was not a shooting war at American uh, forces. In any case, uh, the hostilities, as conventionally or traditionally defined, had ended. But uh, certainly, one of the greatest and most generous acts and important acts of American foreign policy after World War II were the reconstruction programs that we fomented in Europe, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Germany, and Japan, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, that was a very far-sighted and enlightened thing to do. And so that today, uh, Germany and Japan are two of our best allies. We have no better ally in the East Asia Pacific region. Do you think region. we could do that in the Middle East? Well, I think uh, we're working on some of it. Uh, certainly, uh, we're trying to increase the capacity of the Palestinians for uh, self-governance. We've got some assistance programs, but you've got to also bring that extremist violence under control. There's some no negotiations going on between the government of Israel and the Palestinians. Actually, if you look at the Middle East today and you compare it to where things were seven or eight years ago, there are a couple of very interesting things have happened. Uh, first of all, in 2000, 2001, there was no Israeli, the Israeli government was not explicitly, openly committed to the creation of a Palestinian state. Nor were we, for that matter. I voted for Resolution 1397. In fact, I drafted a large part of it, which uh, it, uh, affirmed a vision of a Palestinian state living at peace side by side with, with its neighbors. Ms. Livni, as foreign minister, has been engaged in these negotiations over a fairly long period of time with the Palestinians. They've also opened a channel, albeit sort of an informal one, the Israelis have, to talk with Syria. So I do think there's some movement there. And uh, maybe it'll move a little bit further in the time remaining in this administration. But I do think, as I said in my remarks, the conditions have been set for uh, for significant progress, I think, in the peace and process. And I think both sides, it. sorry? I'm going to count on you to promote it. Well, thank you. Uh, I've, I've got about 100 days left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drawing on your experience, would you say that we are currently at a critical juncture with Russia and our relations with Russia? And what do you think the next few steps in ensuring that relations remain friendly, both with Russia and the US and with Russia and the international community should be? Well, I mean, the relationship with Russia is a very important relationship, and it's got to be handled with care. I mean, Russia, first of all, it's a huge geographic expanse. Uh, it's a country with enormous wealth. It happens to uh, be a permanent member of the Security Council, one of the five. And uh, as we all know, it has nuclear weapons. So uh, uh, it's a country that we must and do uh, take seriously, and it is in our interest, while trying to influence their behavior where we have issues with their behavior, and we do in, cer in certain areas, as we already discussed, at the same time, we need to, I think, e explore and pursue areas of convergence where we have interests in common and there are no, uh, there's no particular controversy between us. Uh, important example, uh, working on uh, counter uh, proliferation, uh, nuclear non-proliferation. We have some very good cooperation with the Russians in that area. We also have good cooperation with them in uh, the area of counterterrorism. So my view is uh, let's work er uh, in areas where we, we, we can, areas of convergence, while seeking to address the problems that we've identified. Um, we certainly have no interest, in my opinion, in picking gratuitous fights with Russia. You began your talk by citing 
the considerable progress we have made in Iraq. As of today, do you consider that progress worth the cost that we have expended in American lives lost, in American lives ruined, multiplied several times by Iraqis, plus the billions and billions of dollars which we have expended, which has to yeah. be part of one of the factors causing our current right. financial crisis. No, I understand, and, and I understand your question. Uh, I think we have to deal with a situation as it is and look forward to uh, what's, what are the best courses of action available to us now. I happen to have been ambassador to Iraq, so I lived personally uh, some of the agonies that you are talking about. I mean, I had to go to memorial services for, uh, I went to memorial services for soldiers who died, for embassy employees who'd been killed by rocket attacks on the embassy. So I, I have some personal uh, uh, experience uh, in that regard. And the costs have been uh, substantial, there's no doubt about it. But there's also uh, the other side uh, of the coin, if you will, which is that uh, a, a terrible dictatorship has been ended. Uh, the, a, a democratic uh, uh, form of governance has been uh, uh, the, begun and is making uh, progress. Uh, and uh, I think history is going to judge. And we'll have to see how events unfold. But I think we can reasonably look forward to the prospect that life is going to get better now in Iraq and that uh, 5, 10, 15 years from now, we will look uh, on this uh, road that we have traveled as one of uh, steady improvement for the lives of the people, not only in Iraq, uh, but in the rest uh, of the Middle East. Your Excellency, I'm honored to see you in person. I've watched you on TV many, for many, many years. And uh, second honor is that you gave me honor to ask you a question. So I have a comment and a question to ask you. One comment is that uh, I perceive that the American foreign policy is based primarily on the military might. It is ought to be first on uh, moral prowess and the military might. And the question to you is, uh, you all talked about the leadership, American leadership. I think uh, America must not sit in the world as a military might, but to stall tall morally right. And so my question to you is that I perceive why there is a double standard taking question of Iran. For instance, in that area, uh, uh, Israel has uh, 200 nuclear heads. Pakistan has 50 nuclear heads. And Iran is a signatory to the, uh, to the treaty, and they are telling that our, our intelligence report also says that they have abandoned the, uh, to acquire a nuclear power, but they are eager to have a peaceful uh, nuclear power as you already did with India. So I want your comment on that. Thank yeah, you. sure. Well, first of all, on the question of military versus other kinds of uh, influence and power. I mean, we happen to have a very strong military. There's no question about it. And we've uh, carried out important national security and military responsibilities in our own defense and in the promotion of, uh, of international uh, uh, stability uh, for a long, long time. But, uh, and, and it has a higher profile sometimes in terms of the coverage and the attention it gets. But we've also have been uh, leaders in the field of foreign assistance as I mentioned earlier, leaders in the support, the creation and the support of international financial institutions like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. We have huge uh, cultural impact on many parts of the world. And of course, trade, my goodness. We are the engine of economic growth for all these countries that export literally trillions of dollars of products to the United States. I mean, what better way to contribute to the well-being of the rest of the world and think of the jobs that are created all around the world because of the access that these countries have for their products to the United States market. Now you don't see front page headlines about that every day in the newspaper, but uh, those are important forms, I submit to you, uh, of influence. Now your second um, question has to do with Iran and why, why do we uh, have the views we do about Iran. Well, I think the concern about Iran is that it's in a very volatile region of the world. Um, they are basically, wherever we have interests in the Middle East and wherever we are supporting 
uh, our friends in the Middle East, we find, we kind of find, uh, we tend to find Iraq on the other side uh, fomenting uh, mischief to say the least, whether it's in Lebanon or in Afghanistan where they support the Taliban or in Iraq where they support extremists who are trying to disrupt the political process there. So I think we have a problem with Iran's behavior. Given that fact, uh, the acquisition of nuclear weapons in this volatile region of the world could have uh, incredible knock-on effects. I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia, the, uh, uh, the Gulf countries, the Persian Gulf countries, how are they going to uh, react to a nuclear uh, Iran? Egypt, it's going to send uh, uh, shivers uh, throughout uh, that part of the world. So it's not only because of Iran's behavior, but because of the destabilizing consequences, we believe that uh, their acquiring nuclear weapons would have on the uh, very delicate and sensitive region of the Middle East as a whole. It's um, been my understanding that um, Israel is a nuclear power, and uh, that would most likely be elevating the level of terrorism in the Middle East. Um, it's interesting to me as well that it's been omitted in the overview. But uh, what, if anything, should um, the U.S., the United States policies look like uh, because of uh, the nuclear power that is Israel? Well, I mean, again, uh, Israel is a democratic country. It's a close friend uh, uh, of the United States, uh, and it has uh, our strong uh, support. I think that uh, over time, uh, particularly if there weren't countries that uh, make existential threats against Israel, such as Mr. Amani, Amani Najad of, uh, of, um, of Iran. Uh, I think that, if, if, if that were to resolve itself, and if we could get a Middle East peace between the Arabs and the Israelis, the situation to which you refer uh, might be uh, a little less acute, and there might be less need for uh, Israel to, to uh, be so preoccupied with what uh, its defensive uh, needs might be. But uh, when you think about it, they, have, they only have diplomatic relations in the neighborhood with, with Egypt and Jordan. They lack them with Syria uh, and Lebanon. And I think those situations are going to have to resolve themselves. And then perhaps in the context of some kind of region-wide Middle Eastern uh, nuclear free zone or something, then maybe th that the kind of discussion that you're suggesting might take place. It's been 19 years since the Berlin Wall fell. Can you please explain to me why we still have the ugly relic of the Cold War, our embargo against Cuba? Well, I, f first thing, uh, this is a, uh, a dictatorship that's been in power since uh, 1960. Uh, and uh, through successive uh, administrations, uh, the, the embargoes against, uh, embargo against Cuba uh, has been maintained. Now, um, my understanding is that it has been loosened somewhat in recent years for uh, uh, humanitarian uh, goods to be exported, agricultural products, uh, medical supplies, and so forth. So it's not quite the total embargo it has been in the past. But I think the other question you might have asked is, uh, can we explain why, after uh, having taken power in 1959, uh, Mr. Castro is uh, the sole remaining uh, uh, leader in the Western Hemisphere who was not democratically elected? That's the question I really care about. Yes. I'm a student here in the U.S. and I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that's why this question is important for me. Um, my question is, what is your opinion on the possibility of an uh, outbreak of a war or falling apart of Bosnia, taking into account all the stirred up feelings because of Kosovo independence, and also having in mind that like um, in all presidential debates, uh, the Bosnia was mentioned like an issue of international. Right. Well, I, this is not an area of uh, my particular expertise, but what I think I'd, I'd, I'd say to that is compared to the situation that prevailed uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we're in a much better place with respect to the Balkans in terms of uh, stability there. Uh, the, uh, the, the kind of hostilities and violence that were occurring at that time are, uh, have subsided substantially. 
uh, European countries and ourselves have uh, uh, worked together to try and maintain peace and stability there. We still have substantial uh, forces in that region. So I think that the situation in the Balkans and particularly uh, uh, in, uh, in Bosnia are m much more uh, stable and manageable than they were 10 or 15 years ago. The situation may not be perfect, but I think that by uh, establishing sort of the basic elements of peace and working to integrate the Balkans more into the rest of Europe, Western Europe, I think ultimately will be the salvation of that region. I have time for one last question. Mr. Ambassador, um, you spent your career in, um, as a diplomat. How would you like us to remember you or what's your proudest accomplishment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I was uh, <laughs> a five-time ambassador, sir. <laughs> I was an ambassador to five different countries. Uh, I believe that I uh, uh, was a, a good professional foreign service officer. That's how I'd like to be remembered. He, he thought he'd stumped me. <laughs> the, uh, one is almost transported back to the 1980s today. I can recall when, uh, number, when 41 was here as vice president. Uh, the Berrigans were here, and it was a uh, challenging uh, uh, afternoon. I... Uh, well, I was going to say something that was largely irrelevant, so I'll refrain from doing so. <laughs> the, uh, the, these were, uh, uh, our board of trustees often complains that our, our audience is too old. And uh, I think all questions but one tonight were from our student uh, uh, audience. And uh, I now have some ammunition when I go back to the board. <laughs> In any case, I was impressed by the direct and forthright answers of our guest. We're absolutely delighted that he was here to share his time and expertise with us. Thanks again so much. <laughs>